Merchandising. Second week we're spending on merchandising transactions. Last week was all about perpetual procedures. This week we're drawing the contrast between perpetual and periodic and focusing on the periodic journal increase and the resulting financial statement formulas to present this information to others. The biggest change is in the income statement. You need to learn the financial statement formulas that uh, allow us to communicate that information. We're working exercise 519, 245. I hope you'll turn there with me. 519 on page 245. And it's similar, very similar, to an exercise we worked last week. So what better day than today to get a step ahead, to commit yourself to answers, to think you know how to do this, show yourself you know how to do this, get it right, volunteer, participate mentally or verbally, and build your confidence. Let's read. 519, page 245 says, presented below is information for our company, five transactions. A, prepare the journal entries to record these transactions on our books using periodic inventory. One, April 5th, purchase merchandise from our supplier for $19,000, terms 210 net 30, FOB shipping point. Who pays the freight when it's FOB shipping point class? Buyer or seller? Everybody said? Buyer. Buyer, Buyer does. You're answering that more heartily than you used to. I think you've got that down pat. Can I count on you to know that? Yes, yes. or no? Yes. Who are we? Buyer or seller? Buyer. We're the buyer. Moses, are you volunteer to make me this first entry? Yes. Good. Um, debit. Uh, inventory for 19000 and credit account table. Is correct. Sometimes. <laughs> when is that correct, Moses? I guess probably when I'm not When we're you no, when we're using perpetual procedures, that's the answer. And we're using periodic procedures. Would um, you like another chance? Um, uh, so no, Moses, it minor now, right? oh come on Moses, you can do this. Don't get off that easy. So how do we change that? We decided that last week perpetual was kind of like the asset method. It's not inventory. It is not. That's it's what not. I just told you it wasn't. <laughs> let, me, let me finish my sentence here. I'm trying to lead you to it. So last week we talked about perpetual being the asset method and we debit an asset account. Inventory. But this week, periodic is more like the expense method. We're looking for an expense account to debit. So, anything come to mind? Uh, Moses wants to use a lifeline. I need a hand up. On the land. It's purchases. Mm -hmm. Moses is nodding his head. Oh, now I remember? No, I don't remember. Now I remember. <laughs> now I remember. It's debit, purchases, credit accounts payable. Now, Moses, you want to entertain my follow up questions about this or you want me to get on the land to do it? Get on the oh, <laughs> I should have never given you that choice. Okay, Annalyn, what kind of an accounts purchases? You already answered that question. Uh, asset liability, capital revenue expense? Uh, an expense. It's an expense. Its normal balance is? Uh, debit. Debit. So what happened to it when you debited it? It increased. It increased. It goes on the balance sheet or the income statement? It goes on the income statement. Is real or nominal? Nominal. Closed or not closed? Closed. Closed in which step? This second. Who got every answer right in your own brain that Annalyn just said? You need to be answering the questions to yourself. If you answered on the test for the first time, no wonder you're not pleased with your performance. You gotta answer them in here. That's what this is all about. On the sixth, item two, paid freight cost of $800 on merchandise purchased so didn't we decide in the first one that we were supposed to pay the freight and we were the buyer and all that stuff? Mm -hmm. There's no surprise here. We knew we were going to have to pay the freight. Who's willing? Tim, did I see your hand up? Yeah. Tim, let's do it the Moses method. Let's talk about what we would have done last week, perpetually. 
Oh, oh, Tim! Tim wasn't wasn't expecting that wild card. Uh, I'm saving the real entry for you, Tim. I'm going to use the lifeline. What would we have done last week to make this entry, Victoria? You would debit and you join. Last week, because we were trying to carry out the cost mm -hmm. principle, we debited inventory for the goods and inventory for the freight. Everybody say, uh huh. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Tim, you're up. Um, it's it's periodic, Tim. Debit freight in for eight hundred and credit cash. Rate. Debit freight in and credit cash is correct. Who's with Tim and me? Say yes. 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 Good. Hey Tim. Yeah. What kind of an account is freight in? It's an expense. It is an expense. Now, is it an expense just like all the other expenses, or is there something different about this expense? I, you know, when I'm looking at all the expenses in their level like this, I, I'm looking across here and oop, there's freight in. It doesn't seem to be oop, quite in line with the others. You know what I'm driving at? Mm -hmm. You can say it's an expense correctly, but there's more description that we can give to this. There's more ways to describe it than that. Lifeline? Yeah. Yeah. Lifeline? Talk to me. Okay. Um, freight in, you add to net purchases, and all the other ones you have to subtract. From it, here, here's my real question. If purchases went away, what would happen to freight in? That's what I'm trying to get you to see about this. Are they all in the same level, or is freight in a little different? And I think freight in's a little different. I think freight in's connected to purchases. Purchases is the one that's in the line here, and freight in's connected to it. So if purchases goes away, perpetual, then freight in goes away, there's no such account as freight in under perpetual procedures. Y'all knew that from last week. Yes, that's why we just introduced it this week. So, Ryland, there's a special way to describe that relationship that freight in has to purchases. In Monday's lecture, we named it sub-purchases. Sub Connected to purchases, related to purchases, added to purchases, Tim, or subtracted from purchases? Added. Added to purchases. Purchases, normal balance is, the freight in's normal balance is, there you go. Are y'all with Tim and me? Mm -hmm. yes. We add them together because their balances are both debit. They're the same. So does freight in go on the balance sheet of the income statement? Well, the rule we learned was that contra accounts go on the same account, and contra is connected, related to, like freight ends connected and related to. Contra means opposite, sub means the same. Yes? yes. So it's connected to purchases. If purchases goes on the, Tim, then freight in must go on the, there you go. Yes? Is freight in close or not closed? In which step? Sorry. Good. Along with all the expenses, all the nominal accounts that have debit balances. If you've got a question now, it would be a good time to ask. Let's do another. Seven. April 7th, purchased equipment on account from a supplier for $23,000. I'm looking for a new volunteer, Caroline. Okay. Um, you would debit equipment for $23,000 and credit accounts payable. For I'm going to go with the credit to accounts payable and ask you if I should debit inventory. No, because that would be perpetual. How about purchases? No, that's also perpetual. How about supplies? No. How, what did you say? I said no. No, the real entry you made me. What did oh, you say today? Sorry, equipment. How about equipment? You like that one? Yes. Does anybody remember this very conversation last week? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was hoping you did. Isn't there an appropriate time to debit every one of the name the account names that I named? Yes. When would you debit supplies class? When you, when you bought supplies. When would you debit inventory? Mm -hmm. Don't say when you were debiting inventory. Try to say it where it's not so obvious, Webster. <laughs> When you're using, when you're buying goods you plan to sell, using perpetual, Cameron says. Yes? yes. When would you debit purchases? Mm -hmm. What are you buying? Uh, 
What are you buying? Merchandise. You're buying merchandise. And which method are we using? Periodic. periodic. Oh, that ought to be it. Then this is periodic, Caroline. Mm -hmm. Purchases? No. I thought we were using periodic in this problem. We are. Not purchases? No. Why not? Because it's equipment. Ah. So last week we had a pretty good lesson, and this is supposed to be a recap, a reminder of that, that we don't always debit purchases for everything. Mm -hmm. The intent of goods that we plan to sell to others is the key. Mm -hmm. And the intent here is we plan to use it mm -hmm. for our own purposes. Mm -hmm. It's debit equipment, credit accounts payable. If you're with me, say yes, everybody. Yes. 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 Good. Am I on four, April 8th? Yes or no? Yes. Return merchandise, which costs $4,000 to our supplier. I need a hand up volunteer. Here she is, Mary. Mary, I want to know if you followed my advice. Yes. Well, it was just a sneaky question because I knew you did. I knew the answer. I had the privilege of standing at the front of the room and watching Mary follow my advice. What's my advice, Mary? To look back. Look back. Look back as far as it takes. Look back 500 transactions and find the entry where this originated. And then do what, Mary? And, uh, yeah. Turn it around. Yeah. Yes? <laughs> Say your entry again. Uh, debit accounts payable for thousand, and then credit uh, purchase returns and allowances. Debit accounts payable, credit purchase returns and allowances is the opposite of the first entry on the screen, isn't it, Mary? Yes. Isn't it, class? Yes. Hey, Mary, what kind of an account is purchases, returns, and allowances? No. Well, I guess in the biggest, broadest scheme of things, I'd have to give you a right answer, but I can get you the, uh, for expense, but I can get you to a better answer than that. Would you go with me? Yes or no? Yes? Would you like me to lead you? Yes? Okay. Did y'all hear me say expense was the right answer? Mm -hmm. What's the normal balance of an expense, Mary? Uh, debit. Debit. What's the normal balance of purchase and returns and allowances? Credit. So if I gave you five choices and you had to color in one of these, you might color in expense. That was the part about this is right. But if it was fill in the blank and you could say anything you wanted to say, <clears throat> you'd have to say contra expense because it's the opposite. <clears throat> so does it go on the balance sheet or the income statement? How did you figure that out? So there was a little pause, and then you got the right answer. What were you thinking? Because it's uh, contra-expense. Contra-expense. It goes the same place where the account it's related to goes. Purchases goes on the income statement, then purchase and returns and allowances must go on the income statement. So that makes it real or nominal? Nominal. So is it closed or not closed? Closed. In which step? Step one. Step one. I thought expenses got closed in the second step. Uh, because the, the normal balance for the, the partial return is credit. So you close all the, you debit all the nominal credit on um, I step thought one. I was in Tim Cobarton Hall at a concert. Mm -hmm. Did you hear how beautiful that was? Mm -hmm. Huh? That was good logic, wasn't it? It's closed in the first step because it's a nominal account with a credit balance. Is this revenue? Uh, no. I thought when we named the four steps, we said revenue got closed in the first step. But it's not just the that was just the summary. That was just so we could stay together and say it. But you knew from the very beginning there was a bigger explanation than that, didn't you? We said debit all nominal accounts that have credit balances <coughs> and prepared for this moment when purchases, returns, and allowances gets closed in the first step. Are y'all listening? Yes. Figuring it out? Getting it right? Yes? Let's do another. Yes, Cameron, is that a question here? That is a volunteer here. Oh, to wash my car? Um, maybe not today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's hope. You didn't, you didn't say completely not. Okay, here we go on 
the fifth transaction, April 15th, paid the amount due in full. Well, Cameron, usually my tradition on this one is to get a whole lot of people to volunteer. There's several debits, several credits maybe, several account titles, I should say, lots of amounts. I, I, I want a whole lot of volunteers. I'm going to let you tell me one thing, one account title. Okay, you're going to debit accounts payable. That's the one I wanted to hear. You're off the hook. Thank you very much. Christy? The debit amount you $15,000. I was going to look for another account title. May I come back to you in one second? Oh. I'm looking for another account title, Jenna. Cash. It's debit, accounts payable, credit, cash. And we've been doing that for a long time. That's the reason I like to start there. That's bare bones journal entry that everybody in the room ought to understand. We've done that since chapter two. Paid off what we needed to. Now, I like to start there, and then I like to start with the debit to accounts payable, Christy. How much? 15,000 or 19,000? 15,000 because we originally purchased and owed 19, but then we returned some and reduced accounts payable. Now we're paying off everything we owe. Class, are we going to write a check for exactly that amount, more than that, less than that? Say something. Less. Whoa. Thank you. Do you know the amount of the check, Victoria? Mm -hmm. Your hand was up. Yeah. Dennis? 14700 14700 has been suggested. I need an auditor. That's correct. That's correct. You're supposed to say that's right. That's right. Shall we practice that again? Dennis? It's 14700 I need an auditor. That's right. Okay. That's better. I thought debits and credits had to equal. They do. They, do. they don't. They will. When you... Oh, I need a hand up. Michael? Credit purchases discount. Or sales discount. Speak up, Michael. No, because you're, you're, you're the buyer in this case. You know. Not sales discount. Right. How about inventory? No. How about freight out? No. How about freight in? No. <laughs> Those are both. That doesn't have anything to do with this. Usually when I'm making that, I'm sorry. Usually when I'm making this list, I at least come up with, <laughs> with reasonable answers. <laughs> that wasn't even reasonable. Uh, I might, Michael, I think the big debate here is between, oh, there's two, two debates, really. Um, inventory or purchase discount? Purchase discount because inventory is for perpetual. Correct. Did y'all hear that? Mm -hmm. Last week, we credited inventory in this very entry because it was perpetual. But this week, it's purchase discount or sales discount. Purchase. Why not sales discount? Because the buyer. This is buyer's point of view. Oh, is it purchase discount debit or purchase discount credit? Credit. There's two reasons, and I like to hear them in a certain order. Um, the first one is that it's a contra expense. So and therefore? It's normally going to be credit. Sweet. And then it also because it has to add up. Debits and credits have to equal. So you said debited or credited? Credit. It's purchase discount. Way to go, Michael. Did you hear Michael's good explanation of this? Yeah. It's doing its job. It's normal balance, it's credit. Hey, Michael, what kind of an account is purchase discount? Contra expense. Contra expense. Therefore, it goes on the balance sheet or the income statement? The income statement. Real or nominal? Nominal. Closed or not closed? Closed. In which step? In the first step. Because? Because it has a credit balance on this number. In the first step, we close nominal credits. If you're with me, put your hand up high. Good. And then the exercise said, B, assume that we paid the balance on May 4th instead of April 15th. What journal entry would you make? Dennis, have you made me a whole entry yet? Uh, no, sir. May I hear it? Yes. Uh, accounts payable for 15000 and cash for 15000 Debit accounts payable and credit cash for $15,000. If this entry hadn't been made, then this is what the entry would be. What's the difference in these two entries, Dennis? Uh, we're paying in full instead of... Well, the other one said we paid in full. 
That, that means we're not going to owe anything after we pay this. Keep going. We didn't, uh, we didn't get the discount because we didn't pay within 10 days. Yeah, I, I should make a bigger deal out of did we pay in 10 days this time. So the, we really, really bought it on the 5th and paid for it on the 15th. So that's how we qualified for the discount to start with. And then this is explaining that if we bought it on the 5th and didn't pay for it until May 4th, we don't deserve the discount anymore. Mm -hmm. That's the big deal. Good job, Dennis. Anybody have a question about this one? Yes, ma'am. I'm confused on why we just did that. It was just an assumption to, that the authors gave us to consider what would have happened if we hadn't paid on time. If we don't pay on time, we then we don't get the discount. Right. So these two entries <laughs> wouldn't both happen. This one included taking the discount and paying less as a result of that. So this this one, we didn't take advantage of this account We paid the whole thing. Gotcha. Was thank that you. it? Yes, thank yes. you. Um, I know generally, but can you explain one more time exactly which each number in 210 that thing means? Yes, gladly. Oh, how about I get a student to do it? Sweet. Somebody answer Chase's question. Tell me about the expression 210 net 30, Tim. Uh, the, two, the first two is the percent of the discount, so it would be 2% discount within the slash is 10 days. And then the net is the full, you have to pay the full thing within 30 days. The N stand for, for net. You didn't ask that. You knew that part? Yeah. Okay. Two is the amount of the discount. Okay. Ten is the time period in which you can take that discount. Gotcha. Ten days. The whole thing, net, in 30 days. Okay. okay? And it's, that's a very common way to do it. Who, who's got a question? That was a good one. Let's do another exercise. Oh, let's talk about... <coughs> How do we wrap this up and present it to others on the financial statement? That's the question. I think there are seven financial statement formulas that wind up on the income statement, and I think you've been introduced to them. I'm hoping they're in your brain now. I'd like for us to review them. If you can resist looking them up in your notes or the book right now, I'd appreciate that. Don't look. If you have to, look. But if you can resist looking, let's just see if we can come up with it and get you to remember them just because they make sense, okay? The first one is net sales. If you can say the formula for determining net sales for me, would you hold your hand up and volunteer? Would you? You subtract sales discounts and allowances and sales returns and allowances and sales discounts. It's correct. Well said, Will. Thank you. The first one is net sales. Sales minus sales returns and allowances and sales discounts is net sales. Now, from net sales, we subtract something. You know its name? No. What do we subtract from net sales? Do you know its name? I think it's cost of goods sold whether it's periodic or perpetual. It's a big deal. It's a big issue this week especially. Last week, cost of goods sold happened with technology with bleep at the cash register, which I thought ought to be bleep bleep. You remember that story? Mm -hmm. That we earned revenue and incurred an expense. And because we were keeping up with it, benefiting from technology, we debited the account cost of goods sold. But this week, yesterday in lecture, we introduced cost of goods sold as a formula, which is really the reason we're having this conversation. I'm wondering if somebody in the room, without looking back in your book or notes, could say cost of goods sold to me right now. Who's got the nerve? Michael? Is the shortened version is correct. Yes, precisely. We're going to come back to it in a minute. Now, Michael said beginning inventory plus purchases. And my curiosity is about purchases. Can you describe for me net purchases? Riley, how do you get net purchases? Purchases minus uh, purchase returns and allowances minus purchase discounts. So that's parallel to net sales. Net purchases is the main account reduced by its contract counts. This isn't new to us, folks. The only one that doesn't fit the pattern is capital and drawing. The first contract count we learned was John Doe drawing. And when you subtract it from capital and get the result, that result doesn't have a name. Most of the other 
I want to say all, but I haven't checked it out. Most of the other main accounts and contra accounts combined yield a result worth naming. The first one we learned was equipment minus accumulated depreciation. Do you remember its name? If you do, raise your hand. What do we call equipment minus accumulated depreciation, Mary? It's called book value, and everybody in the room should have known that. What do you call sales minus sales returns allowances? Everybody said? I didn't hear you. Net sales. And Ryland says, it's the same pattern. The main account reduced by the contra account purchases minus purchases returns and allowances is net purchases. But then the question comes, is that truly the amount we spent for the goods we bought? And the answer is no. What's missing here, I need a hand up. How are we gonna get from here to there, Christy? Uh, we're almost there, but not quite. I got the same volunteers I was hoping for a new one, Cameron. Uh, you add freight in. Add in the freight. Now we learned last week, freight's part of the cost of the item we're buying. And we're just re-emphasizing that. Is this really the amount we spent for the purchases? Everybody said no. no. Cameron says it's the freight that's missing. We've got to add in the freight to get cost of goods purchased. If you're with me right now, say yes. yes. Now, Michael said the cost of goods sold formula was beginning inventory plus purchases. Are we ready to do that now? Yes or no? So I need a beginning inventory here to add to purchases. Beginning inventory plus purchases is called, everybody said, I should have had a heartier answer. You could just read it off the screen. I pushed the button too soon. Goods available for sale. Now, these aren't just the Scrabble letters dumped in a fishbowl and rearranged and drawn out and try to pronounce them, folks. This is a descriptive thing that's trying to talk to you so you don't have to memorize it. Does the expression goods available for sale say anything to you? Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Yes. If I sold anything to my customer, I either sold them something I had to start with or something I've acquired since. These are the goods that are available for sale. That's why we named it that. How clever. Now it seems to me only two things can happen to these goods. What are they? You either sell them or don't. Try. No. <laughs> no. Let's do that again. You either sell them or you either sold them or you didn't. Which is easier to count? What you have. What you didn't sell. Y'all want to cancel your fall break plans? No. Go all over town? No. Oh, I wish I could show you what you looked like yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> you were sitting up straight. You had your neck kind of pushed out. Your eyes were bugging out of your head. You were stone faced. There was not a crack on your. Oh, you were no smile. <laughs> Woo, you were sweating. <laughs> Which is easier to count? What you have. These goods that we have. And what's the name of those? Inventory. Ending inventory. Ending inventory. So we had beginning inventory. The beginning of the year, first thing, because we counted it the day before, the last day of the year. And now we're going to, what are we going to do with this ending inventory? Subtract, right. Subtract out the ending inventory. What do you get? Say it, everybody. Uh, on Thursday, I expect everybody in the room to be able to recite this to me, and I didn't just say memorize it. I think you ought to be able to do it now. If you see the logic of this, you ought to be able to recall it to your memory and say it without reading it off the screen. Read it off the screen this one time. If you know the cost of goods sold formula, say it with me. It is beginning inventory plus purchases is goods available for sale. Goods available for sale minus ending inventory is cost of goods sold. Say it again. Beginning inventory plus purchases is goods available for sale. Goods available for sale minus ending inventory is cost of goods sold. Say it again. Beginning inventory plus purchases is goods available for sale. Goods available for sale minus ending inventory is cost of goods sold. I'm not going to say it this time, but I expect you to go. Beginning inventory plus purchases equals goods available for sale 
Goods available for sale, fine and semi inventory, useful cost of goods sold. Good. Thank you. Now, I don't want you to memorize it. If you memorize it, think about an actor on stage. You memorize your lines, they memorize their lines. How do you remember your lines but the cues that they give you? If they forget their lines and don't give you the right cue, then you can't remember yours. If you memorize this and forget it, someday you're not going to be able to recall it. But if you understand the logic I've presented, and you understand that this is done this way for a reason, then if you forget it, you can recall what you're trying to do. You can think through it logically and come up with it again. Pick you a focal point in the room of your choice. Look someplace else than the screen and say the cost of goods sold formula. Go. Beginning inventory plus purchases equals goods available for sale. Goods available for sale minus any inventory equals cost of goods sold. Good. Let's move on. So there's seven financial statement formulas and we're almost there. Net sales, net purchases, goods available for sale, uh, cost of goods purchased, goods available for sale, cost of goods sold, and gross profit. How do you get gross profit? Quick. Net sales minus cost of goods sold. And look, I've arranged it so nothing's in the way. These are all lined up. The logic of this ought to be net sales minus cost of goods sold. That'll get you gross profit. And how do you get net income? It's not that simple anymore, Victoria. We've complicated it a little bit. The chapter one, two, three, perhaps four answer to that is revenue minus expense. And that's still true. But it's a little more complicated now. Somebody say how to get net income from this point. I need a hand up. Come on. <laughs> it's not that hard. You're making it harder than it is. Annalyn? I was going to say something about the expenses minus the net. We're going to start with gross profit, right where we left off. And? Subtract expenses. All the rest of the expenses. We still have expenses. We just elevated cost of goods sold because we're a merchandising concern, because it's such a big deal, we elevated it and tried to determine this subtotal gross profit. How much are we making on the products themselves before we incur the rent and the utilities and salaries and all those other expenses? It's gross profit minus expenses is net income. Are you with me or not? Yes? So let's count them one more time. So. That's the seventh one. I've got a number. S net sales, net purchases, cost of goods purchased, goods available for sale, cost of goods sold, gross profit, net income. Seven financial statement formulas that you ought to know. Let's put them to good use. Turn with me to 516. It's on page 244. 516 on 244 says, on January 1st, our corporation had merchandise inventory of $50,000. At December 31st, we had these balances. Alphabetical order, it looks like. At December 31st, we determined ending inventory to be $60,000. A, compute gross profit. Well, a translation of that instruction would be Let's prepare an income statement through gross profit. That's similar to what we did in lecture, similar to what I just talked about in generic terms on the screen. We have the information in this problem to do that. Let's do an income statement. What's the first thing we should do? Sales. No, you do the title. <laughs> <laughs> you put a good heading on it. Thank you very much. That publisher is spoiling y'all, putting headings on everything. You need to put a good heading on it. And right after the good heading, somebody said? Sales. Sales. It's sales. If you know the amount of sales in this problem, hold your hand up so I can listen. Let's go, Dennis. 840000 Is that truly the amount of revenue we earned, class? No. Can we get there from here? Yes. Would you explain it to me? I need a hand up. What a good day for you to participate. <laughs> Mary? 
Say one. An amount. And? And? Class, does it matter the order that I list these? Should I list them in alphabetical order? Does it matter? Am I going to get a different answer if I list them in a different order? No. no. Why did I list them the way I did? Do you know, this is a different question, but I think it applies here. Do you know the suggested order that expenses should be listed on the income statement? It was mentioned in chapter one. Mm -hmm. Didn't hear you? In descending order, yes. you said correctly. The highest one to the lowest one. Now, we're not counting wrong in your homework if you don't do that. But think about the service that you would provide for somebody else. If you put them in alphabetical order or random order or the order they are in the ledger, then it's okay. You're going to get net income. But what do you think your boss is going to do or some other interested party is going to do as soon as they look at that income statement and look at net income? Then they're probably going to start looking at the expenses thinking, I wonder which one of these is largest. I wonder which one is the next largest. And if you listed them that way, then you would be providing the same information, but more information and a service to the interested party. It's a good idea, and I think that's why I did that. Now, if I sum these two, I get, and there's no real name for that. So when there's no name for it, we just put it on the same line, extend it over to the other column so I can use that result. Now what? Subtract that. We subtract the sum of the contract counts from sales and get 825,000 is net sales. You ought to be a step ahead instead of a step behind. We need to find cost of goods sold. If you can say the cost of goods sold formula right now without looking your hand in your book or notes, put your hand above your head. We just said it 16 times and I've got half the class with their hand up? Come on. Can y'all say the cost of goods sold formula? Put your hand up. Put your hands down. Don't look at it. Say it. Go. Good available for sale. Good available for sale minus ending inventory equals cost of goods sold. That was pretty rough. <laughs> you can do better than that. Thursday? Yeah? Thursday? Okay, help me find it. You said beginning inventory. This one says, I'm about to show you my cost of goods sold calculation. This one says, you watch, you wait, I'll tell you when I'm finished. Here we go. Cost of goods sold is beginning inventory. Say a number in the problem. $50,000. Didn't hear you. $50,000. $50,000. Sort of sounded like $15,000 to me. $50,000. And to that, we're going to add, everybody said? Purchases. purchases. If you know the amount of purchases in the problem, Say it out loud right now. $509,000, I was told. <clears throat> yes or no? Yes. Is that truly the amount I spent for the goods I bought? No. Then I need one person to tell me what I need to do next. Christy. Subtract uh, purchase discounts and purchase returns and allowances. Purchase returns and allowances and discounts were 6000 and 2000 maybe not in the same order you said them. Yes, Christy? Yes. The sum of which is $8,000. If you're with me right now, say yes. yes. Do you see where the numbers are coming from out of your book? Yes. yes? What shall we do with this $8,000? One hand up volunteer. Dennis. Subtract it to $509,000. What is the name of what I get? You get net purchases. And what is the amount of what I get? $501,000. $501,000 is net purchases. Is that truly the amount I spent for the goods I bought? Yes or no? No. Not quite. That's better than the 509. We're not quite there yet. What do I need to do? I need a hand up. Chase? Uh, you're going to have to add the cost of shipping, which is freight in for $4,000. $4,000 of freight needs to be added or subtracted? Added, because we had to pay for it. Added, and this connects to a journal entry we made earlier today. All that conversation in the journal entry, all that me quizzing that person and getting all that 
Are you going to add it or subtract it? The, the whole notion of saying it's sub-purchases is to remind you that you add it. It's not contra. If it were contra, you'd subtract it. It's sub. And you add it. And you add the 4,000 and get... Anybody five, said? 505,000. 505,000. What's the name of that? That's... That cost of that's truly the amount I spent for the goods I bought. This is just when, when we say purchases, we say purchases and I mean all this because I don't think I could get you to say all this to me and sound like a choir. <coughs> Are you with me or not? This is truly the amount I spent. Cost of goods purchased. It's talking to you. And what happens to that? Now what? Hand up. Ryla? You have beginning in inventory and cost of goods purchased, and that gives you uh, goods available for sale. Beginning inventory plus purchases is goods available for sale. Anybody got me this sum? $555,000. $555, only two things can happen to those goods. What are they? Buy them or sell them or you don't sell them. You either Buy, sell them or you don't. <laughs> Could we leave out all the wrong answers and do this right? Only two things can happen to these goods. We either so, sold them or didn't we didn't, which is easier to count. Do you remember the story yesterday in a lecture about being at the cash register and ringing up two things, cost and retail, no technology, the sales price isn't here, and then you've got to look in your catalog and, oh, the cost was that, and I'm going to ring that up too? Remember that? Mm -hmm. How long is the checkout line? Really long. Out the front door. I mean, it's miserable, and nobody's going to shop there very many times encountering that. So we cut out an entry. We decided not to record cost of goods sold at the cash register and created a problem at that point that we're trying to solve with this calculation. Only two things can happen to these goods. I either sold them or I didn't. I had an opportunity to account for them at the cash register, and I didn't. And to think about going all over town and trying to count them now is the height of ridiculousness. Is that a word? Kind of reminds me of athleticism. I'm not sure athleticism was always a word either. Every time I listen to a football game or a basketball game. You all with me here? Mm -hmm. Only two things can happen to these goods, and the best way to solve this problem right now is to consider the goods I didn't sell, because here they are, right here on the premises. All I, all I have to do is count them. How much are they in this problem? If you know the numbers, say it. $60,000 $60, is <coughs> ending inventory. Goods available for sale plus ending inventory. Goods available for sale minus inventory. Which is it? Minus. If I had all these goods and I didn't sell these, then what does that leave me? Not a number, but a concept. Listen to my question. If I had all these goods I could have sold and I didn't sell these, then what's this? Cost of... Okay, you, you told me a minute ago, only two things can happen to these goods. What are they? You either sold them or you didn't. Now, which have we just accounted for? The ones we didn't. The 60,000 is the ones we didn't. And if we subtract the ones we didn't, what do we get? The cost of the ones we sold. The cost of the ones we sold. And what do we call that? Cost of goods sold. How much? You got me a number? 495,000 is cost of goods sold. So, Look at the screen. I'm going to point. We're going to say the cost of goods sold formula again, but it ought to make more sense now than it did when you walked in the room. Here we go. The formula for determining cost of goods sold is beginning inventory plus purchases equals goods available for sale. Goods available for sale minus any inventory equals cost of goods sold. Are you with me or not? Yes. yes. It's the most logical thing we do, and you really need to know it the rest of your life. Talk about it in the nursing home, okay? Now what? What are we going to do with that? Subtract it from net sales. Subtract it from net sales. Net sales minus cost of goods sold yields a concept. What's it called? Gross profit. What does the world call it sometimes? Profit and loss. Sometimes they call this Mar margin. gross margin. Gross margin. We call it gross profit. Got me a number? 330, 330, now look at the columns. 
I needed to make a calculation, so I moved over. I needed to make a calculation, so I moved over. I needed to make a calculation, so I moved over and brought the result back and made a calculation and made a calculation and took this result. Now, when I put this result here on that line, I didn't have to give it a name. It really doesn't even have a name. But if I wanted to show off how smart I was, I could have put this one on that line and not named it. But I put it on this line and named it. You don't put it here without a name. And then I made a calculation, and then I made a calculation, and I brought this result over here because it goes with this one. And now these are unobstructed. The user of this financial statement sees that this minus this is this. And what would I do to finish this off? Minus the expenses. Subtract out the expenses and get net income. Are you better off because you came to class today? Yes. Do you know some things you could practice? Yes. I hope you will. Have a nice day.